Good morning. My name is Daniel Truss, and I'm here to start our panel on the public and private sector innovation in the area of digitalization. Greetings to everybody. Greetings to the organization of this tremendous conference, which actually is t it's touching on what I think is the critical element of progress, which actually has been the critical element of progress for a very long time, maybe since we started growing after the Industrial Revolution. It was at that time that we started putting a focus on the entrepreneur, protecting the entrepreneur. The intellectual entrepreneur, the, the one, the men and the women that had the ideas, the commercial entrepreneurs, those that actually could set up a system to take it to the public, and also the social entrepreneur, those that actually did this for the sake of making society better. It is, in fact, a world where we bring together those with ideas and those that take it to the public that makes progress go forward. That is what innovation is all about. It's about taking things to people, new ideas and new solutions to people. So what is new? So what does digital bring that is new? What it brings is speed. What we have nowadays is that everything moves very fast. We need to be very fast at innovating. We need to be very fast at taking things to the market. We need to be very fast at making things our own. And this is the new world of digital transformation. It's a world where we create, we take it to, to the people, and we do it very fast so that we move there early and we move there fast. And to be fast, we need to work together. We need to bring together governments. We need to bring together business. We need to bring together schools and universities. All these have to work in a very symbiotic process, a very close process, learn to work with each other in this system of cooperation. And it is, it is this collaboration that we ensure that resources are used effectively, that we bring new ideas, and that we actually address the issues of people. And so in this world where success means bringing together knowledge, science, and entrepreneurs taking things to the market, there are three things that I think we need to, put, they need to come together, and I think will become clear throughout this conference. One, can we have the policies and laws that allow government to do its role? Two, does business and the civil society have the conditions to take things quickly to the market and call them their own? Three, are schools ready to produce the kind of brain, the kind of intellectual might that we need to, uh, to, to move forward in this new digital age? And so let me take a few minutes to address each one of these pillars of the world that we need to live, that we need to build. A world that, has, again, needs to be very much intertwined so that we are seamlessly connected and we work together to take things to people really fast. Let's talk about policy. Let's talk about laws. Let's talk about the protection of intellectual property, which is the core of what we're here to talk about today. It has become harder, of course. There are laws. Laws, globalization, as we've just heard, has built competition between different countries. It's becoming harder to protect. Different countries will easily step forward and there's competition between countries. It's easy to reproduce. Today, I, build, I create a piece of news. I create intellectual property. And it can be easily replicated, almost a picture in my living room. And things can be spread throughout the world at a speed like never before. Issues like brands, issues like intellectual property, issues like uh, artist production, issues like journalist production are now more and more challenged because it's so easy to reproduce them. It is also difficult because there's a lot of speed in the way things work. I innovate today, and someone else will innovate quickly right after. Creativity is hard to define if I just tweak things a little bit. The point I'm making is that innovation is increasingly difficult to call it your own because there's too much trying, too many people, too much possibility of tweaking it and making, making it new. And so it's very important that the way government works is not just by protecting those that innovate, not just by protecting intellectual property, but by being in proximity with business, by being in proximity with schools, by being in proximity with the entrepreneurs, so that we create a sort of joint program to move things forward. The internet came when a project led by government, by the military in the United States, 
force DARPA to create new ventures. So government also can play a role in innovation this, in this way. It can actually bring companies together like the Japanese did in the 1980s, bring companies together and make them in partnership with government, create new ideas and new projects. And I do think there's a lot of space to do more of this in Europe. I do believe that, for example, the experience that we had on Airbus, which brought not just new ideas and new technology, but it also took it to the market in a way that was very effective at Europe and you allowed Europe now, actually, to have one of the dominating companies in, in, in airplanes, those experiences need to be replicated. And we stopped. I don't know why. Again, we need to work together. And it's not just about putting one university. It's just about big projects that will transform and that will put European companies in the lead in the innovation space. A second point that I'd like to mention is that business itself needs to have more conditions to work together. Needs to, we, can have, we can have more competition, limits on state aid, limits on co uh, competition policy, sometimes prevent business from working together to be fast and be powerful at, and be in innovating, having new ideas, having new pro intellectual property, and taking them to the market. So I do believe that on the business side also, there's work to be done. Work in terms of allowing more space for new projects where business works together, and work in terms of allowing more flexibility. We cannot expect that Europe's role is going to be to create, build few patents, and sell patents to business that happens in China and business that happens in America, who in the end are actually going to actually make most of the rent from what that patent builds. We need to build those patents. We need to build that knowledge. We need to take it to the public. We need to do it fast, and we need to call it our own, because that's where the value that we create for people in Europe is. Our inability in Europe to create large companies in the last few years has been a real problem. We innovate, but we don't make value out of it for European citizens, and we need to be, make it together. And the third element is, of course, the schools. Universities, schools have to work together in this partnership with the government doing their role in coordinating and in, and in protecting intellectual property, with business doing their role in working together and taking things to the market very fast and assuming leadership positions at the global level, universities and schools need to change. And it's not just about technical, technical skills that universities need to deliver. We need to deliver more curiosity. We need to be in universities, which I come from, need to be more open. We need to transform ourselves to work more closely with the private sector, speak the language of the private sector. And so, this transformation, this building of this ecosystem where we all do our part is the key element of transformation that we need to do. It's not just about creating laws. It's about transforming the way we work every day. More daring and curiosity. More desire to take things to the market and take to people and to do it really, very really fast on the side of business. And on government, more ability not just to protect intellectual property, but to actually foster its creation by promoting large projects that bring science, European science, to the forefront. I do want to leave with one point, which is it's always difficult to start when you're in the back. It's always difficult to start if, if you're already starting from behind. And there is one point where Europe is not starting from behind, which I think is the agenda for our future. We in Europe are absolutely leading the sustainability agenda for the world. If we, if, we take part of, if we build on that leadership, on that sustainability leadership that we have, and we create a strong ecosystem of universities, of business, of government, that brings about the new revolution in intellectual property, in ideas, in new solutions, that actually address the sustainability challenge that is not just European, that's for the entire humankind, I think we have an opportunity of actually creating a new revolution after the, after the digital revolution. We should be leading on the, on the innovation side, the sustainability revolution for the world, together, in partnership, but again, accepting that each one of us, in business, in universities, and in governments, needs to transform the way it operates because it has to be fast and it has to be effective. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful for this invitation and I would like to 
share my screen. Um, let me see. Oh, yes, put it full screen. Yes, let me move. Um, do you see the full screen version? I hope so. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, um, it's a great honor to be able to share some thoughts uh, at this conference. Uh, the topic is uh, certainly a very relevant one. Um, uh, I'm yeah, sorry, we see, we see also the, your notes uh, and the oh, next slide. Yeah. So Let's, please, yeah. I suggest you to change the view. Um, that didn't happen in the test. Let's see. No. Maybe, maybe like this. Um, this one. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that looks better. Um, yes. So. Oh, I see weird things uh, happening on the screen, but hopefully that's okay. Um, yeah, so um, I'm I'm an innovation scholar. Uh, I've looked uh, in the last years in my research at the economics and the geography um, uh, on innovation. Oh, uh, <laughs> I see. I see that my my words are are being translated into Dutch somehow, but. Anyway, I will not be distracted uh, farther. Um, so I've, I've been looking at the economics and geography of innovation activities, uh, and I've been leveraging intellectual property rights as actually fantastic data uh, that allow us to monitor and track uh, uh, new inventions, uh, uh, um, uh, new ideas uh, of all kinds of sorts. Um, and uh, so whenever uh, a company or another organization is, is filing a patent or trademark or another IPR, uh, that tell us something about uh, um, yeah, economic activities and, uh, and innovation taking place. And when we aggregate this information uh, uh, on different firms and organizations to regions and countries, then we are able to say um, even more about you know, how competitive and possibly also how resilient are our places. And so I would like to uh, also say something that might uh, help us understand uh, how Europe uh, is likely to be faring in the in the next uh, um, in the next years. Yes. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, my starting point is in a way quite similar to uh, what different people have uh, shared with us in the opening uh, speeches uh, that innovation and entrepreneurship are really at the heart of uh, regional and national economic resilience. And especially at this time uh, with this pandemic crisis that we really um, should focus on resilience as the main performance indicators for, for regions and countries. Um, so in that sense, it's not simply about short-term, uh, uh, simple GDP growth figures, but it's really about um, an evolutionary ability to continuously uh, adapt and reconfigure systems to ensure that there are uh, new opportunities coming up in a creative uh, process. Um, so my um, my take uh, uh, this morning will be that the full spectrum of innovation matters. Right? So not only science and technological uh, opportunities, but also um, softer forms of innovation, organizational innovation, um, uh, new business models, also new services that are often digital services. Um, and I also would like to mention, and here I really also standing on the shoulders of some great Portuguese uh, pioneers. Uh, so I would like to also mention a few of them, uh, Manuel Mira Godinho, Teresa da Silva Lopez, Aurora Teixeira, and my longtime collaborator, Sandro Mendoza. And so they've also uh, done a lot of research on the topic of innovation uh, and intellectual property rights. Um, so uh, what can intellectual property rights 
uh, data monitoring tell us about our economies. Right? So by now we have uh, scoreboards like the European Innovation Scoreboards, which uh, has also a regional counterpart um, that uh, include information on at least three intellectual property rights, uh, patents, uh, trademarks, and design rights. Um, so before um, you know, I uh, uh, dig in dig a bit deeper into uh, you know what we can learn about European com competitiveness. Let me stress the opportunities, but also some of the caveats of monitoring this type of uh, of data. Um, so um, basically, I think that uh, when you look at intellectual property rights as, as filed by by firms. Uh, that they are a signal of organizational assets, but also strategies and uh, also uh, capabilities. And so I will organize my uh, reflections along these three uh, dimensions. So that intellectual property rights are um, more important as assets of, of companies that determining, determine much of the company value. Uh, has also been stressed by the president of WIPO. Uh, he, he also mentioned this idea uh, that economies are becoming more and more intangibles. Uh, so uh, I've put here the cover of a, of a very insightful book uh, whose title is Capitalism Without Capital, uh, meaning that uh, it's not just the physical capital uh, that matters, it's more uh, the non-physical intangible capital uh, that really, um, uh, uh, yeah, that it, it re that really matters for uh, for company value. Um, because of this increasing importance of uh, of intellectual assets, uh, we also see a process of marketization of IPRs, and so we see more and more trade uh, um, in, in, in patents, uh, uh, trademarks. Uh, uh, so uh, licensing uh, in and in out licensing uh, also by uh, in and out of uh, different types of IPRs, right? which is a sign that um, these intellectual assets uh, uh, are also very much in demand uh, um, uh, in the demand of of, uh, of other companies, uh, even though uh, it might be difficult to actually um, uh, transfer the whole knowledge uh, uh, that, it, that comes with um, the development of, uh, of, of such assets. Um, here I, uh, I have two graphs from, uh, from a recent uh, WIPO report, uh, which provide kind of the long-term picture of uh, how uh, um, uh, IPR applications have been increasing and very much so especially in the last few decades. And so if you look at this, these plots, um, which refer to the global trend at the, the five major offices for patents and trademarks, you see very clearly the rise uh, of the intangible economy. Um, and you see many other things, but let me stress only two, uh, given the sake of time. Uh, you see that the, actually the growth uh, in trademark applications has, has been even more uh, it's even been stronger than the growth of patents. And this has, in my view, to do with uh, with at least two main uh, trends, uh, the one related to servitization, and so moving companies moving to providing uh, solutions uh, rather than uh, just uh, uh, products, uh, and of course, digitization, uh, which has uh, made some uh, yeah, some of the offerings of companies more and more intangible and, and digital. Um, we also see uh, that these spikes in both graphs are referring to China, uh, and uh, it is interesting to know that China's upgrade has not only been on the technological side, but also on the side of trademark applications, and uh, referring to also a shift from uh, maybe a focus on low cost production to a focus on uh, more of the differentiation strategy. Um, so IPRs are also uh, telling a lot about firm strategies. Uh, so when we look at 
uh, where uh, companies are filing in terms of technological fields, uh, but also in terms of uh, the market classes in which they file uh, trademarks, we can uh, uh, learn a lot about uh, um, uh, technological trajectories, trajectories of commercializations and, and general evolution of, uh, of, of company strategies. Um, at the same time, um, uh, uh, since companies are becoming themselves more and more strategic about IPRs, we see also uh, an issue of increasing systemic costs of having IPR uh, systems. And so whenever firms are strategizing too much, we see litigation costs uh, rising. We might observe uh, IPR gridlocks uh, uh, where uh, uh, IPRs are used to block uh, fields of action uh, for other companies and we see uh, congestion in RPR offices. And so there is a question also of uh, maybe too much uh, or too strategic use of IPRs by, by companies. Um, so if we look at um, uh, the actually the, the, uh, what the data are telling us about the fields of action where uh, companies are filing IPRs, um, these are two graphs uh, still from the from WIPO uh, about patents and trademarks, uh, and we see uh, that the top five fields of technology uh, are very much about digital uh, and about health. Uh, so uh, digital uh, accounting for basically um, the first uh, three of the top five uh, fields of technology, and we see that also in the um, the type of uh, um, the products and services that are being uh, uh, protected uh, mostly with, with trademarks. Right? So it's about software, it's about business services that are often connected to digital services, uh, other technological services, uh, but also um, health and pharmaceuticals. So, and so uh, when we look at this, this, this data, uh, this confirms what we would expect uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the fields of action of, of companies. Um, but eventually, uh, actually, intellectual property rights are uh, also telling us something about uh, capabilities of companies. Uh, so uh, before a company is able to file for a patent or a trademark, there's a lot happening um, that uh, requires uh, skills, routines, operations, um, uh, and uh, so um, uh, a trade uh, a patent or trademark filing is in a way a, a proxy of these underlying capabilities. Um, there, there has been an interesting study um, uh, uh, by um, uh, IPO and EU IPO together on uh, high growth firms uh, um, that has showed that if, if we look at um, SMEs uh, that have filed IPRs, uh, that they are more likely to be high growth. And so in a way, uh, IPR filing is also a proxy for the quality of entrepreneurship. Uh, and so there is a lot of to be gained to, um, to understand also uh, how SMEs find their way uh, to the IPR uh, system. Uh, of course, the caveat is that um, there's a lot of uh, organizational capabilities out there that can all, cannot be captured fully with, uh, with IPR filings, uh, uh, especially, indeed, if not all uh, the companies that have produced something uh, uh, new uh, uh, or valuable for the market or society are able to find uh, their way to IPR systems. Um, so... It, I, I truly believe uh, that combining insights from different uh, IPRs, and in this case, I'm, I'm focusing mostly on patents and trademarks, allows us to really capture different types of assets, strategies, and capabilities. Uh, so uh, looking at patents, tell us a lot about technological assets, uh, uh, strategies as regards to entering specific technological fields, uh, uh, competing uh, on technological grounds and diversifying in certain technologies, while uh, trademarks tell us about reputational assets, uh, uh, tell us more about commercialization, activities, uh, market competition, um, and uh, at the capabilities level, uh, uh, they can tell us both about uh, on the one hand, uh, invention, and on the other hand, uh, more 
uh, downstream uh, innovation. Um, and the important point is also that when you look at patent, you are focusing mostly on uh, high-tech manufacturing as the sectors uh, and also on larger mature firms while um, uh, also um, uh, incorporating the trademarks uh, uh, you are able to focus on um, uh, manufacturing and services uh, as well uh, and also um, uh, you are able to capture um, uh, innovation activities of firms of all sizes and ages and so in a sense uh, of course, there is a lot of complementarity uh, between patents and trademarks, but there is a lot uh, that we can also learn uh, uh, from uh, from adding trademarks to patent statistics. Okay, um, so in in the last part of my talk, I would like to bring geography into the picture. Uh, so as I this, this is the focus of my current research. So what are regional and national opportunities and risks if we look at uh, IPR data. Uh, so let me um, mention a, a recent study by some Italian and Greek uh, colleagues uh, that have uh, done a, um, that have done a study on uh, um, on resilience of regions in Europe. Uh, asking the questions where, uh, where whether innovative regions as measured by uh, regions with higher uh, levels of filings of patent and trademarks um, are uh, uh, turned out to be resilient and they used uh, the, 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 uh, the financial crisis uh, uh, as uh, the test bed of their hypothesis. Of course there is a lot we can learn from history uh, in order to uh, to better understand resilience also in the current crisis and, uh, and, uh, and historically. Um, what they find is, yes, uh, more innovative regions are more resilient, uh, uh, and this is about the resilience of the companies that are located in, uh, in those regions, and they find that both patents are uh, capturing uh, uh, resilience in terms of uh, the, the development of uh, new technologies, but also trademarks capturing the resilience in terms of bringing new uh, solutions to the market. Uh, that they uh, that they matter. Um, uh, the other side of the coin is that uh, since innovation tends to be cumulative, uh, so you build on what you've learned from the past, uh, history matters, that you see uh, that winners and lo losers tends to get reinforced over time. Uh, so all any gaps that you might see uh, across regions, um, uh, any asymmetries uh, will tend to intensify uh, over time. Uh, so if we look at uh, the, uh, the maps of Europe in terms of patents per capita or trade per capita, um, we see uh, that indeed um, this type of IPR activities are very much concentrated in a few places, in a few regions uh, in Europe. Um, trademarks applications are uh, somewhat less uh, concentrated or they are concentrated in different regions, uh, but still we see kind of a European IPR divide, eh, which is something that uh, I think we should uh, worry about and consider in our um, uh, reflections for the future. Um, this is, uh, to put things more in the global perspective, this is a, a, a map from a, a recent WIPO report on the geography of innovation. Um, that displays uh, um, worldwide uh, um, hotspots of innovation uh, in uh, red and blue. Um, and you see that looking at things globally, uh, that in Europe we, we have uh, many science and technology innovation hotspots. Uh, so we should, you know, be proud of, uh, of uh, uh, being on this map uh, because it's it's a map with uh, with only a few uh, uh, dots uh, that are colored, um, uh, but uh, we have also other um, uh, assets and capabilities um, that might be discovered looking uh, more broadly at all different types of IPRs. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, quite a number of applications for design rights. Uh, so uh, yeah, we are faring quite well uh, as as Europe. Uh, globally, 
And we have also uh, um, other IPRs, like for instance, geographical indications. Uh, this, uh, uh, this news item calls them uh, a European treasure. Um, and I yeah, think uh, one of the speakers uh, this morning will also discuss um, about geographical indications. Um, and these are uh, uh, intangible assets that have been uh, developed over time, uh, thanks to our uh, history and uh, thanks to people, people and organizations that uh, that are beh be yeah, behind uh, um, a specific specialty. So, what uh, combinations of answers in the intangible digital economy uh, to to try and uh, provide some concluding remarks? So, I was very much inspired by um, uh, by the kind of the slogan or title of uh, of today's conference. Uh, so I was thinking, okay, so we have a great past that has allowed through history to uh, to build uh, all kinds of intangibles. Uh, um, and uh, my point would be, uh, are we creating or allowing enough space for both hard uh, and soft intangibles? Uh, so intangibles that have more to do with science and technology uh, and uh, other intangibles that may have to do with reputation, specialties, uh, uh, cultural heritage, um, and, and other. Um, how can we promote innovation and prosperity without worsening this European uh, IPR uh, innovation divided that we unfortunately see? Uh, so I think that uh, here, um, if you are able to move more and more towards uh, seeing innovation as uh, as a uh, as a means uh, than as a goal in itself, then we that we can redirect efforts to uh, uh, to providing creative solutions to societal challenges, to regional challenges, uh, maybe related to sustainability, uh, instead of focusing only on um, uh, providing targeted. Uh, policy efforts for increasing R&D investment or um, technological uh, capabilities only. Um, and what about digital technologies? I think uh, that many uh, um, uh, many speakers today will offer clues uh, on uh, on how uh, digitization is bringing uh, opportunities and risks, uh, uh, also in relation to IP. Um, of course, IPRs uh, are uh, the key institutional pillars in, in, in tangible digital economy, uh, economy uh, to protect both companies and consumers. Uh, uh, but yeah, they they should be both enablers uh, and uh, uh, and uh, not introduce uh, uh, risks. Uh, so to conclude, uh, uh, let's remember the assets, uh, the combinations of hard and soft intangibles that we have in Europe. Let's action on the capabilities towards certain means on which we agree, uh, whether it's about sustainability, whether it's about fairness and in inclusion. And let's reflect on the strategies, seeing digital as, uh, as, as a technology that allows us to creatively reconnect, re reconnect um, old and, and new assets. And with this, I conclude. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess we have three speakers, and I'm here as a moderator. So my job is to, uh, are we supposed to stay with this? We can take it off. So it is safe here. Hi, everyone, all of you at home. Uh, we have a, 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 an agenda for about half an hour to discuss some of the issues that were brought up after Carolina's great intervention. She talked to us about innovation, but she told us that it's a capability to deliver value to people. Uh, and that's the way we build on competitiveness. And so I want us to, uh, I have a, a distinguished panel here to discuss other elements of this. Uh, Rita Kuchara, uh, she is professor of computer vision and AI and for automotive, and she's the director of the Alice Unit at University of Modena and, in, and Regilio Emilia. And she's also the director of the Italian National Scene Lab of Artificial Intelligence and Intelligent Systems. I have Luis Caldas Oliveira, who is actually right next to me. Luis teaches entrepreneurship and innovation at Technico in Lisbon, at the University of Lisbon. And he's the director of, of, of Start Lab, the, the Technico's innovation laboratory. 
He's also a member of the task force of innovation of CESAR, an association of over 50 leading science and technology universities in Europe. And finally, also from home, Ricardo Pajmamed. Ricardo is an associate professor of political economy at ICTE, the University Institute of Lisbon, and he's also the president of the board of the Institute, of, of Pub, the Institute for Public and Social Policies. Thank you, all three of you, for accepting to be here to continue to discuss these elements of innovation, and now also on a focus on the relationship with universities, where I am, Carolina is, and all of you are. And so my idea would be to give you about five minutes. Uh, I think we're going to have to shorten it a bit for five minutes, and then maybe have a conversation for the time that we are left. And maybe I would begin with you, Rita, uh, on five minutes on discussing the new issues on the regulator regulatory frameworks related to data. OK. Uh, can you hear me? Absolutely. Go ahead. OK. Thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to, to, hear, to be here with you. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not an expert in protection of intellectual propriety, and, uh, but I am a user of that since uh, I'm working uh, in, uh, in AI and we are developing uh, system, intelligence system and software system that very often discuss uh, uh, the problem of, of IP together in university and together with the industry. So these uh, few minutes, uh, I would like to discuss uh, of, uh, one uh, important problem that's carrying out uh, with a new machine learning system. Uh, whenever you do not only research, uh, but uh, the research is transferred uh, to uh, industrial uh, application. In particular, uh, I'm thinking about what also uh, the Dr. Darren Tang uh, Waipo um, said before, is that uh, the we need to understand how IP transition can be done in the world of digital transformation and also in the world of, uh, of AI. Uh, probably many of you are aware of uh, the, the work that the European Commission is doing about uh, data and about artificial intelligence. And in particular, I'm referring on the white paper on AI and uh, um, an ecosystem of excellence and trust that was, uh, has been presented last year. And uh, in few months, uh, also the new one will be done about regulatory issues uh, on AI. In particular, one topic uh, is about uh, accountability, so about uh, uh, and transparency of the system. And I would like to, to discuss with you about what we can do also at university about discussing uh, how can you we we develop new software new system and also to define which are the ip problem connected with the machine learning system uh, just a few uh, words uh, to be a bit more technical about what i'm thinking about let's consider the new uh, um, machine learning uh, architecture, especially I say neural network or deep learning architecture that can be used uh, in many different uh, contexts. For instance, uh, I'm working in computer vision, but uh, it's the same in other topics. And you can use the same architecture, I don't know, for anomaly detection and predictive analytic in industry or for detecting anomaly in a radiography for health system. So we are discussing about the architecture, about data, and about the results. So technically, when you develop one system like this, both in research and in production, you have uh, uh, many different uh, things. So the first is the software architecture that is very general. The second is uh, the loss function, the optimization function, and the hyperparameter that have been the, the discussing. The third is the, the generic data set that you are using to training. And the fourth is the specific data set of refinement that is typical of a specific problem or a specific company. Uh, or, or And then uh, you have the result. So when you put together all these ingredients, uh, who is uh, uh, the owner of uh, the data, the software, and the system? What are the uh, intellectual property for this? So uh, who is the owner of the rights of everything of that? It's something that uh, nobody discusses in deep detail of this kind of thing. So whenever we at university are working with a company or a European project or in some of that, 
we can decide or to give all the rights to the company or to the uh, the customer of that or to share that or decide to to go a license together this is a big enormous problem that uh, in this moment uh, nobody discuss on because it's the problem not only of the data but also of the parameters that are created and finally on the result uh, I have no time, but there is an enormous amount of research in generative design, so in generative uh, networks that create new data. So who is the owner of this uh, new data that are created? The software developer, uh, the people that give the data on training, the, everything. So this is something I think uh, we could discuss together at European level in the next future. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Luis, you're up. Yeah, uh, I, I'd like to, to follow up your, your ideas of uh, the need for collaboration and the need for speed uh, with the digital transformation. And I would like to, to talk about this in, this in the context of the industry university collaboration. Uh, we know there is a conflict in this collaboration. Universities have the mission to, to make knowledge available to everyone. They teach that knowledge, uh, but also to have impact in society. But companies, they need to have a competitive advantage, so they want some type of confidentiality. They have some type of secrecy. And this conflict, when, when we try to collaborate, makes it very hard to negotiate uh, things. In the United States, this is more or less solved. Special, uh, this problem is particularly serious when there is public money involved, when the, the collaboration is sponsored by uh, public funds. So this in the United States, this is more or less clear because there is a law that says that when this happens, the ownership goes to the university. But in Europe, we have no such kind of uh, regulatory context. So negotiation takes a long time. So it goes against your idea of speed. So we take a long time to negotiate how to collaborate in a R&D project. And now, as uh, Rita was telling about, we have a new challenge that is data. Uh, not just data that is needed for training machines, but also data that comes out of research. Research day nowadays is done with a lot of data and research generates a lot of data. Uh, and so there is the need, as Reed was saying, who owns this? And this must be in a contract. This must be established beforehand. Uh, so, I, so there is also a speed need because if you, you don't, don't use the, the data that is already there, so you have to do it again. So you have to recollect the data. So companies have a lot of data that are, that are inside their, their premises, and research could use that. But since they can, they have to recollect it again. So the speed, again, is the sharing not just of intellectual property, but also of the data. And this does not mean that this is going to be open data. There is something completely different here that is uh, what we call the fair principles of data. FAIR means for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. It does not mean it's free, it does not mean that everyone can use it, it's just created, it's put in a way that can be, that, that can be used. So what can you do about this? I, I have three proposals. Uh, one of them is regulatory, as I was saying. We need to have stricter rules on what to do with, as Rita was saying, what to do with data, especially, or data and other results of research especially when this comes out of publicly funded money. Uh, for instance, we can have rules that say after a certain amount of time, this data needs to be made public, like we do with patents. After 20 years, uh, the, 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 the rights expire. Uh, or we can have a, a way that uh, data that is generated from publicly funded research, uh, has to, a part of it has to be made public. You can keep a, a small amount of it private. But you need to have rules. And uh, the concept that we heard this morning that as open as possible and as, as close as necessary is not really a very good measure. You, you need to have more strict rules regarding what to do with data. Uh, the second thing that we need to do is take on examples like the Alexir, uh, the Alexir collaboration, European collaboration organization that shares data for life sciences. This is an amazing example where people from different countries, researchers, they use a platform to share data. This is a challenge also for universities because universities are used to generate data, produce a research, make, create a paper, and that's it. And data stays the, the way it is. It's not reusable. So we need an extra effort to do with data to make it reusable. And my third idea that's uh, inspiring in several things that we can see in Europe, but it is 
is still very local, is what we call strategic partnerships between universities and companies. It's not a project by project base, but you need longer collaborations, uh, things where, for instance, you have in Leuven, KU Leuven has a very interesting collaboration with a very important industry, and, but it's not just one project, it's a continuous collaboration where going back and forth data, you know, things that are being done, to students that can move to the university, from the university to the company. So these long-term uh, strategic collaborations should also be supported by, by uh, European Commission, especially in this program, the new program, uh, the Horizon Europe. Uh, and that's it, was it, mostly. Thank you, Luis, wonderful. Ricardo, your turn now. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the, the invitation to be here today. Um, when we talk about innovation, uh, references to university industry uh, collaboration are, are very common. We already uh, seen this uh, this morning. Um, and in, in this, my introductory notes, I'll, I would like to refer to a less often mentioned type of collaboration, which is one between the university and the public sector. Uh, I, I think that the, this is particularly, imp well, we know from the history of innovation that uh, very often the collaboration between the university and public sector has been uh, crucial to some uh, very uh, important development in technology. Um, and I believe that uh, we are living in a period, the, this one of digital transition, in, in which uh, the, uh, the collaboration between the universities and public uh, sector became again uh, very central. Now, um, it's, uh, uh, it's quite evident that um, the public sector can benefit a lot from developments in uh, artificial intel intelligence, uh, like to, to optimize public policies by improving planning, monitoring, evaluation, by uh, customizing collective services in education, employment, social protection, health, um, to increase the effectiveness of uh, inspection, in inspection and auditing activities, to reduce administrative costs, to improve the efficiency in the use of resources, to improve the interaction of between the public services and citizens and firms. I mean, we know that the opportunities to use uh, artificial in intelligence to, to, to to improve the efficiency, the effectiveness, the quality of public services became quite uh, evident. Now, um, we know that uh, by adhering to this process of digital uh, transition, governments are not only uh, becoming more effective and efficient, but they are also um, contributing to test new solutions, which is uh, a role that uh, governments have played a lot in innovation in the past. And these new solutions can uh, lead to the immersion, to the emergence of uh, um, new business projects uh, or uh, more generally to um, new technologies. Now, uh, I think that, uh, first of all, that the collaboration between the public sector and the universities can play uh, here a crucial role since uh, universities provide not only the competences, but most of all, the possibility of testing digital solutions before uh, public, the public administration incurs in significant sunk costs. That is, there is a process of uh, uh, trial and error that usually private firms are not um, uh, actually uh, do not have the vocation to do that in universities can have an important role in here on the, on the other hand universities can uh, benefit from having access to problems that are yet to solve and can, that can be both uh, a useful pedagogical tool but also an opportunity to test new ideas uh, about how to solve certain types of problems uh, but there is a tension here, and to some extent, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, Rita has, has already mentioned this kind of uh, tension, and Luis, to some extent, has also mentioned this kind of tension. And the tension has to do with, with uh, the problem of intellectual uh, property. Uh, we know that intellectual property rights are expected to act as an incentive to innovate. Um, and uh, that is its main social value. On the other hand, 
we know that intellectual uh, property can also have a social cost, a social cost which is related to the risk of diminishing the speed of innovation diffusion. And in the case of digital uh, transition in the public sector, this risk is uh, more worrisome since the, the externalities are quite significant. Now, Rita has already uh, mentioned uh, many difficulties that are related with uh, how to, to define intellectual property in this field. And um, it's a, a problem not only of how to, to, to define, but it's also how to allocate these rights and how to avoid that the allocation of property rights becomes a main obstacle of uh, diffusion. Um, in this domain of digital transition, and I'm finishing now, um, a good innovation policy should be concerned not only with the introduction of new solu solutions, but it should also be uh, very much concerned with fostering its rapid diffusion. So I think that we must avoid um, uh, an error, a mistake of uh, mixing up innovation with uh, intellectual property rights. Intellectual property um, can work sometimes as an obstacle to, to the diffusion of innovations. And uh, I think that the, the, the principle of commons, the principle of uh, property rights that are supposed to be um, not a barrier to innovation, but should be actually uh, wide available has to become a central issue in this in this field because the opportunities for replicating as uh, Rita was uh, mentioning the opportunity to replicate solutions that were found for, for certain that were found for certain problem, problems and can be replicated to other problems at a very low cost uh, has to become an, uh, a fundamental issue here. So I would uh, like to bring in this, uh, this discussion to this forum. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, all of you. Let me, I'll just try to build a synopsis, of, a synopsis of all this and then throw a question that I'm gonna give you all a chance to answer in your terms. And so I think what we've been building up on is this notion of, of, of the role of innovation and the, the focus on speed. And I think uh, um, Ricardo just mentioned this, this idea of the speed and, and, and of bringing it to the people, because in the end, it only makes a difference when you bring it to the people. Carolina, Carolina mentioned the role that organizations make on this, and Ricardo mentioned the capabilities in the government sector, and Carolina put a big emphasis in the capabilities of firms, that in the end, innovation is about the capabilities of the public sector and of firms of actually deploying them. She talked about strategies of capabilities. But I, one thing that came all throughout was this need that whatever firms do, government does, universities do, we're doing it together. All the challenges that we talked about here is the challenges of us doing it together. And the challenge here is this, is this you know, and Rita Vera put it forward, which is when you have business, universities, and now Ricardo is bringing government, so there's a lot of transaction costs. You know, we have to negotiate, as Louise was mentioning, we have to decide who owns what. And, and whenever you have transaction costs, you, you slow down things. You waste, you, lose a lot, you waste a lot of value when you have lots of transaction costs. And so it's very important that if we want in Europe to build a system that is fast, and fast is the road to success, if it's fast, we need to work on these transaction costs. Now, to reduce transaction costs, which is about people bringing together, we have one good system, and many of you have pointed out, you know, good rules make things easier. If we know, if we have a, a, a standard contract, we have basic rules, we don't have to negotiate so much. But another element of bringing down transaction costs is about the people. It's about the organizations. And so my question to you, to each one of you, and we are in universities, and this panel is about universities, and we're all at universities, is how we, as universities, need to change to bring down those transaction costs and to make this process a lot more effective, productive, fast, so that we do our part of the job. Because we can demand changes in policies, but change always begins with us. And so my question is how universities need to adjust broadly defined, not just yours, but others that you know, need to, def need to, need to, need to adjust to be a, 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 strong, uh, a strong engine uh, on this. And for example, not just for what we do, 
but the way we interact with business, the way we interact with government, which are different organizations, speak a different language, and yet we need to basically find ways of translating and moving fast. So maybe I'll start with Rita. What your ideas about how we can change as universities? Okay. I think that this is an enormous problem uh, because uh, it's a problem of everyone, but nobody tried to discuss together of that. Uh, I'm in the Department of Engineering and so Ferrari in Modena, so we are working a lot with companies uh, and we have to discuss uh, each contract uh, with companies each by one by one uh, together with our organization. Then we have we try to, to work together at level of university and especially a level of uh, Emilia Romagna regions because we have a, a big connection uh, between uh, the Modena, Bologna, Parma and the other university. Then we have to discuss uh, at the Italian level. So this is a problem that we are discussing at Italian level and probably the most important should be to work uh, at European level. So it's really a problem because uh, if we don't have a common rule for everyone, at the end we will waste an enormous amount of time just only to decide this new ownership uh, that nobody discussed until now. So we have really to rethink everything. It's a problem that I have no solution, but I think that we could start at European level coming from the top to the back uh, in order to, to have some regulatory support uh, and suggestion that can be used uh, at every level at university because at the time uh, uh, at the end it is exactly the same problem that we have in Italy in Lisbon uh, in Stockholm uh, and uh, in every part of Europe thank you Rita Luis your thoughts that universities can do to help this collaboration. Uh, but I'd like just to point out something. But I'm sorry, Luis, I also wanted to talk about our culture. I mean, so how yeah, do we operate? At uh, what I was going to tell about. So I'm, I'm from a technical school. So people are much, much more interested in the technology than in the business part. And we have to understand that innovation is knowledge, but also a business model. Uh, and I think that something that we can do is to train our researchers, our students in the part of the business models. That's what companies do very well. So we feel this collaboration from industry is good because c companies know how to put in place business models. We are good at creating knowledge. So by this collaboration is also so creating ways to have fruitful uh, collaborations without a long time to establish contracts by having these Combi uh, agreements that are long term, uh, these partnerships that are strategic. We don't have to create agreements for each project. It's just the same, the same contract that goes on. But also, our role is also to understand that companies need a better way. The, the knowledge needs to be better packaged. Uh, you know, you have to create. You know, we have a lot of data that might be useful for companies, but is stored somewhere in our systems. Uh, right now, research, even the research notebooks are digital, uh, and companies want to have access to that. So we have to, uh, to store everything in a way that can be reused. Uh, and this is a challenge for universities, especially for the technical ones that generate a lot of this type of knowledge. So you have to change the mindset of researchers and students to understand there is value. The value is not technology, it's technology plus the business yeah. model. And then what companies need to put this, this, model, this business model in place. It can be actually the students themselves that are going to do that, but we need to train them. Thank you, Luis. Ricardo, your thoughts? Well, I would like to extend this uh, reasoning uh, by Luis to, to, public, uh, to the public sector and also to non-profit uh, activities, because uh, actually uh, I think that we are uh, promoting a bias in, in the way universities work. We have two main biases nowadays. One is to, to foster publications in international uh, reviews, uh, international journals that very often um, uh, tend to, to uh, benefit uh, research that uh, is not uh, directly applied or uh, is uh, quite uh, abs uh, works at a quite abstract level. And on the other hand, so many researchers are being uh, pushed to uh, university industry collaborations in order to bring uh, money to the universities, given financial difficulties that universities have. But uh, actually, we, we should uh, keep in, uh, in our minds that universities play other uh, social roles. And as I was uh, saying before, I believe that we are living in a period in which universities can have a very important role in uh, helping the public sector to, in, it, in this digital, digital uh, transition. And this means 
is that if we want this to happen, we have to take into account the system of incentives that exist in the university. We will not have this happening if researchers will only uh, have their uh, careers uh, moving forward on the basis of uh, con uh, contracts, uh, profitable contracts with the industry or with uh, papers being published in a higher, highly ranked journals at international level. So I don't think that universities now should stop doing these two things, but universities can only uh, cannot do only these two things if they want to be socially useful. Uh, other kinds of collaboration must be um, uh, integrated, but must, must, be, must be taken into account in uh, the incentive systems of uh, researchers and university professors. And I think this is a big challenge that we have to take into account. Uh, the EU is doing actually a, a good job in uh, promoting uh, replication, for instance. We should keep aware of the fact that replication very often means that we are not uh, uh, moving forward knowledge. We are just making it more available to more people. And this is not a kind of thing that universities tend to value, but actually, uh, from a social point of view, very often this is the most valuable thing that uh, universities can do is to spread knowledge, is to help uh, diffuse as much as possible what are uh, ready-made innovations. So I think there is a, a balance here that has to be kept in, uh, into uh, kept in our minds. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you to the three of you for um, your contributions. We are going to get towards the end. My only summary of this is that uh, we need to work fast. The only way to work fast is to work together. In order for us to gather intellectual property under legislation is very is important because it allows us to reduce transaction costs. But the biggest challenge is that we need to actually learn to work together as organizations. And this means that universities have many changes ahead of us, as you've highlighted. But if we had more time, we could also discuss how government and how business needs to change to be also a partner in working together. I leave you with that challenge. Thank you very much.